This program is brought to you by the Stanford Humanities Center. For more information, please visit us at shc.stanford.edu. I'm Patty Lundberg. I'm Executive Director of Humanities West. I welcome you on behalf of the Board of Directors of Humanities West. Everything we do is a team effort, and uh, nothing can be done without you, our longtime patrons, and now I hope some new patrons who are coming to see our unique uh, programs, exploring history and celebrating the arts. Before I get into any details, I really want to uh, introduce to you our uh, co-sponsors for the evening, which includes the Consulate General of Italy, the Italian Cultural Institute, the Da Vinci Society, and the History Department of Stanford. But I don't want to delay another minute to introduce to you Paula Finland, who has been here several times before, who is a great patron of Humanities West. And she is the Pirati Chair of uh, Italian History at Stanford and Chair of History. She's been chair and not chair, and now she's chair again. And uh, she has, uh, uh, you know, great experience with medieval history, with the dawn of the Renaissance, with uh, digital humanities, and also um, with uh, a, a great love of the humanities for the public. So please welcome with me Paula Finland. Thank you so much. It is always such a treat for me to be here at Humanities West. Um, I, I, I never cease to be enthralled by people who will come out at the end of a long day to talk about the past, um, which of course is what I'm also here to do as well. So what I'm gonna try to do tonight is to offer a bit of an overview about some of the issues that we'll explore in greater detail um, in the rest of the program you know, between today and tomorrow. And at the center of the program today is exactly this paradox, right? How in the late medieval world did the Renaissance begin? We often view these things retrospectively. And what I want to do is to start with what is surely the most canonical moment that people will point to repeatedly when trying to identify a moment where we see the Renaissance emerging. But I'm hoping by the end of this talk tonight to give you a version of this Renaissance in a somewhat different way. So let me begin here with a particular date. <laughs> I do this in honor of the professor who taught the first class I ever took on the Renaissance because he actually did say that the Renaissance began on this day and I've never, <laughs> I've never forgotten that. It was Easter Sunday of 1341. So let me try and set the scene and intrigue you with why this moment has been so symbolically meaningful for generations of medieval and Renaissance historians in trying to identify not the moment that the Renaissance began, but to try to identify clear and compelling expressions of what the transformation of medieval society into something that we have subsequently called the Renaissance might have looked like. All right, so let's, let's cast this Sunday, April 8, 1341, this Easter. On this day, a 36-year-old Tuscan, who'd only been to Rome once before and had spent most of his life outside of the Italian peninsula, found himself on the world stage. Wearing a purple gown, he walked from the ancient Campus Martius past the ancient circuses and theaters lying in ruins, around the Palatine, across the ancient Roman Forum, and finally to the steps of the Capitol, the ancient nucleus, right, of that long dead Roman Republic. What was he there to do? Some of you already know the answer, of course, and the answer is so famous that people have ever since tried to depict it, as well as to describe it. 
On that particular Easter Sunday, a young Tuscan poet who also saw himself as a philosopher in the making named Petrarch, or for those who like the Italian, Francesco Petrarca, was crowned poet laureate by the king of Naples on the Campidoglio, on the Capitoline Hill. So here we see this moment depicted many centuries later, right? A light is shined on Petrarch. Behind him lies the king. Petrarch, in fact, had not gone first to Rome. He had gone to Naples to be sure that he might be worthy of what the Roman citizens had offered him in sending him a letter with this possibility that he would become poet laureate. The king of Naples thought that he was a very good candidate and said, great, I'll come along with you. Let's do this job. And so they did that. This particular moment has been iconic ever since in the history of the origins of the Renaissance because it is a moment in which Petrarch is made a Roman citizen in its ancient and modern, which is to say, 14th century sense. Petrarch was enormously proud of this moment. It was the pinnacle of everything he had hoped and dreamed about up to that point in his life, and it would be indeed a decisive moment for the way he saw himself in the coming years. And here I want to give you a sense of what this scene looked like. If you go to the, the Capitol nowadays, what you have to do is look back through what is no longer there, because the Capitol that we see today was redesigned by Michelangelo in the 16th century to have that beautiful geometric pattern, not to mention the statue of Marcus Aurelius that lies at its exact center, right? The buildings around it also too have long and complicated histories. The museum of famous Roman antiquities that's there nowadays um, was created in the 18th century and has a nucleus of statues that began with papal gifts in the 15th century. So this was a very different Campidoglio. This indeed was the Campidoglio that had not been restored, had not been given its Renaissance. This was not a Renaissance capital, right? This was instead what was left in the Middle Ages, right, of this ancient and symbolic center of the city. Nonetheless, Petrarch was very proud to stand in the midst of these ruins. And he said to himself in many, many different ways, and he said to the entire world forever after, something more or less like this, which I've translated, of course, from the Latin. So what did Petrarch do after this moment? We often stop here and we just say, OK, he read his poem. He thanked everybody profusely, publicly, et cetera. But I want to follow a little bit further this itinerary through Rome in 1341 on this Easter, because the point is that it was Easter Sunday. He had arrived in the capital on Good Friday, right? So the timing of this was also not uninteresting. After Petrarch descends from the capital, he made his way via the Via Sacra to the palace near Castel San Angelo, or Hadrian's Mausoleum, for those of you who want to give it its older name, um, and then went in procession with a large crowd, large and admiring crowd, to the ancient Basilica of St. Peter's, which again, we have to see in our imagination, right? The St. Peter's that we see today, as many of you know, if you've studied the history of that, is, is of course, again, a product of the Renaissance um, with its piazza being a famously a product of Bernini's Rome, right, of a different era. Um, so we need to imagine a very different St. Peter's in which Petrarch strode down the long nave of this ancient basilica, past all of its 22 columns. And as the story was told, he took his laurel off his head that he had received for his poetry that people admired so much that he thought he was a living Roman. And he laid it on the altar. He laid it on an abandoned altar because the Pope was not in Rome. The King of Naples was in Rome. The Romans, at least enough of them, were in Rome. Petrarch was in Rome. But the Pope was certainly not. The Pope instead was at, in Avignon in southern France. And I will talk about this a little further in just a second. <clears throat> 
So the question we have today is, what had Petrarch done to deserve this kind of recognition? We often take it for granted in light, in retrospect, of his enormous literary corpus, his poetry, his letters in imitation of Cicero, his letters to the living and the dead, right? whether they be his contemporaries who engaged in long and interesting conversations, or people like Livy, Cicero, other, other, other dead authors who became alive to him through the reading of them to such a degree that he wished to write them. We think of this enormity of Petrarch's corpus of many different kinds of poetry and prose, both in Latin and in his Tuscan vernacular. But what we often forget when we talk about him this way is that actually was not the Petrarch of 1341. What had this 36-year-old done at this point? He'd published very little. He'd written a few poems. He had discovered a few manuscripts, an unknown oration, for instance, by Cicero that he found in the French town of Liège in 1333. But he'd not yet made many of his greatest manuscript discoveries um, of the lost letters of Cicero, for instance, that he would find in Verona in 1345. He had, however, in his early 20s, reassembled from various manuscripts Livy's History of Rome. He was so proud of this accomplishment that later, after he had been crowned poet laureate, he wrote Livy a letter to tell him how proud he was of putting Livy back together, of reassembling the corpus. But the bottom line is that Petrarch had not yet done a lot. In fact, the thing that he specifically um, was in the midst of that had catalyzed this invitation to be crowned poet laureate was a vast epic poem called Africa that was unfinished in 1341 and would remain unfinished at the time of his death. He would continue to try to write about the exploits of Scipio Africanus um, and his defeat of Hannibal in the Second Punic War for his entire life, right? He could never quite conquer this story um, or the genre he had chosen, as it turned out. But nonetheless, this incomplete corpus was enough to earn this particular glory. Dante had not been crowned poet laureate, nor had anyone else in Rome, at least, prior to this particular moment. And so again, what we need to think about is, why is Petrarch deserving of the claim to be the best Roman that the world could offer in the middle of the 14th century. So what I want to do for the rest of this talk is to give you a sense of Petrarch's world, of Petrarch's experience of his world, of what he took away from the world, how he came to terms with it, and how all of that helps us to understand Petrarch as famously the man who coined the term dark ages to describe not the past, but his own time. As a historical epic, he would rather forget. As I said earlier, Petrarch is especially distinguished by the fact that he spent an awful lot of his life outside of Italy. But in this, he was typical of many Italians in this period from a number of the different medieval Italian states, from Genoa, from Venice, from the Tuscan states, cities, Florence, Prato, Pisa, et cetera, all of them on the move in this period, some at enormous distances, but many of them in Petrarch's immediate world with one specific goal in mind, which was to be in the Rome of Petrarch's day that was not in Rome, but was in the town of Avignon. The papacy and its relationship to the Roman city and those who attempted to control it was in a kind of awful situation at the beginning of the 14th century, at the beginning of Petrarch's lifetime. So one of the salient facts about Petrarch's lifetime is he spent pretty much his entire life observing a papacy that could never get back to Rome. In fact, would not permanently return to Rome until 1420. This affected his family life and the choices they made about where they would live and where they could not live, um, and it also very much shaped his perspective on the world. When he observed the ruins of Rome, the ruin of the old Basilica of St. Peter's, the ruin of the Lateran Palace, right, the Papal Palace in Rome, he contrasted this inevitably, as many, many others did, to the Papal Palace that had arisen in the 14th century in Avignon. And again, I've translated from the Latin so that we all know what Petrarch's talking about here, but you can see this in the size and scale of this papal palace. 
So this is where Petrarch spent his youth and would return repeatedly for most of his early adult life until 1353 when finally he left Avignon behind. But Avignon is formative to him. He was in the midst of his experiences of Avignon as the center of the medieval papacy. And many of his ideas and access to the kind of history and culture that informed his understanding of the value of antiquity, right, this core theme of Renaissance humanism, um, came from what he learned in Avignon. Avignon played a very interesting role in facilitating the emergence of what we think of as Renaissance society and culture in Italy, right? The absence of a papacy created opportunities for others, whether they used them well or not. Right? In the absence of larger authorities, the Italian peninsula in this period had many, many opportunities to experiment with different ways to rule the city-states that dotted this peninsula. Um, the results were often chaotic and violent and unstable in many instances, but at the same time, they also created prosperous opportunities, especially for the Italian merchants and for those who worked for them and who, for those who survived the ups and downs of various political regimes. Italian civic culture thrived in the late Middle Ages like almost no other period. People would look back with nostalgia at the age of the Italian communes, for instance. Italian merchants thrived, of course, in Avignon, along with many other places. There were literally hundreds or thousands of these merchant families installed in communities that replicated the political organization of the Italian states, right? So important was it to work for the papacy. Now, Petrarch came to detest this other Rome. He detested many, many things about Avignon, but he also was able to see the world very, very broadly from there. It was his first and least loved Rome. And it also was the place where he first encountered many of the manuscripts of the ancient authors that he treasured, right? A great library also formed at this papal court and in the vicinity of this papal court, in the monasteries, the access to northern European libraries that Petrarch and others had, um, in part because of the papacy in Avignon, in part because of the large-scale, long-distance commerce of this period, was quite crucial for them when they wanted to reassemble antiquity. Now, let me dig a little bit of deeper into the story so you can think about Petrarch's relationship to different parts of Italy and what this looked like. Petrarch was born in Arezzo. He was born from a Florentine family in exile. They would stay there for a few years, then move to Pisa, and from Pisa, move to Avignon when he was nine years old. He would end his life not in Avignon, not back in his native Tuscany, but instead in the Venetian Republic, where he lived intermittently from 1362 to 1374 for the last 12 or 13 years of his life. He lives in a few other places as well, but primarily in different towns. And his tomb in Arqua is, of course, the great monument at the end of his life, a tomb on the scale of the great emperors, the great medieval professors, the great minds of the Middle Ages had tombs like this, and so did Petrarch. But the point that I want to make is that Petrarch's world, even though it happens in many places, really does indeed start in Florence. So let me start a bit with a story we often don't think about, which is Petrarch's father. Ser Petraco, this is Petrarch's original name, right? He's Ser Petraco's son. Ser Petraco was a Tuscan notary. He belonged to the same world that Dante belonged to. In fact, quite literally, he was exiled in 1302 from Florence when he fell out with the current political regime just a few months after Dante had been kicked out. So in many ways, we can see someone like Petrarco through the lens of Dante, the value of the vernacular, the value of literacy, the importance of the new men of the late medieval Italian cities writing contracts, producing documents, producing legislation, right, for the many political regimes that came and went, producing the mountains of paper in this period, and displaying a new and fundamental kind of literacy that we see embodied, for instance, in the work of Petrarco's friend and Dante's mentor, Bruno Latini, who's depicted here in these images. <clears throat> 
These are images. Bruno Latini, when he publishes in the late 13th century, uh, and here I've given you an example of one of his notarial documents, because he's another Tuscan notary, right, from this, this same world earlier on, from the earlier generation than Dante. So he not only is a mentor to Dante and is a kind of early example of the literary figures working in the vernacular in this period, but with a love of translating aspects of the ancient world, right, of ancient literary culture that they've come into counter with, but he also depicts himself in many ways that starts to model what we see Petrarch doing, for instance. So we see in these images that come from one of his principal writings, we see an image of, of uh, Brunetto talking to Ovid, right? You know, Ovid is his authority sitting on, you know, when we look at this, and then he changes gears, and instead he shows himself now sitting in the authoritative position with his podium, talking to one of his ideal readers. This kind of image of a world of books as a special possession is exactly one of the things that Petrarch takes away and chews on relentlessly. He constantly berates the world he lives in for being overly material, overly concerned with possessions, but he always singles out books as a different and special kind of possession worth investing in. Books speak to us, he writes, they advise us they touch us in our inner core, in the very fiber of our being. Books are special, and there's something to cultivate. Here we see not only Petrarch as the product of a culture that was described in its own time as a region in which everyone had a pen in hand, right? Literacy was so high. But we also see Petrarch, the origins of Petrarch, who would build one of the greatest private libraries of classical literature of his generation, or perhaps any generation and certainly the first one that we can point to, where we have documentation, right, of the scale of his efforts to reassemble ancient literature. The Italy that Petrarch knew was, of course, more than just Florence. In fact, he spent very little time in Tuscany, and not simply because he was in exile, but very much by choice. So I want to give you kind of a sense of what he would have observed in the broader world of this period. And again, I just want to kind of show you in these little vignettes here, this image of Dante, Virgil, and Brunetto Latini all together, right? This is from one of the Dante manuscripts of this period, right? Again, kind of showing you this world of, you know, vernacular authors that Petrarch is looking at. We can start by seeing a little bit of the Italy that Petrarch knew by looking at one of the early 14th century Portolan maps that were created first by the Genoese then by the Venetians and ultimately by everybody else who aspired to long distance travel. If you look at this map, there are a lot of things you can observe, including the profusion of words for all the ports that you might stop in, as well as places in between. But the main thing I want to point out to you is the large size of Genoa and Venice at the top of this map in relationship to the size of Rome. Petrarch described Genoa and Venice as the two torches of Italy. And when he said this, he was not describing them necessarily as centers of this kind of ancient Romanness I'm talking about. Their light came from their commercial prosperity and the way in which they created productive and functioning societies in contrast to the dysfunctionality he saw in so many other places, including his native Tuscany. So again, just to sort of think about what's going on in these two particular worlds, right, when Petrarch first encounters them. At the beginning of his life, the Venetians are heading east. Famously, Marco Polo has returned, and in a Genoese prison, with a Pisan, will produce um, his, the account of his travels. Um, the book of the marvels of the world, right, is in the midst of being written in those years right before Petrarch is born. The year before Petrarch goes to Rome, the Doge's palace starts to be built. Their government is forming, they're reshaping their ancient medieval center as a sign of a society at the height of its empire in the Eastern Mediterranean. In this same period, the Genoese are busy mapping the world even as their empire declines increasingly leaving the Eastern Mediterranean, reluctantly, mostly pushed out by the Venetians, I should add, and anyone else who cared to push them, but especially the Venetians, and increasingly looking westward. Um, this is the world, of course, that will produce Christopher Columbus, 
in a different century. The Genoese are in the midst of inventing maritime insurance, bills of exchange, and again, as I'm showing you here, Portalon maps. And here I'm showing you different ones. Not only the image of the map, most famous Genoese map maker of this period, of Servis Conti, um, but also images of the maps produced in this particular world that are maps not only, say, of the Adriatic, um, in the case of the farthest map I put here away from the map maker, but the one in the middle is instead a map of uh, the North Atlantic world. And so here we see the Genoese constantly reaching outward. This is what Petrarch observes and admires. He only goes to Genoa, to my knowledge, once in 1350. But he certainly saw and observed the Genoese over and over again, especially in Avignon. But now let me return to Tuscany and what Tuscany looks like at the beginning of Petrarch's lifetime. Cities like Florence and Siena were also emerging in this period. Many of the great building projects that become signature features of the center of these cities begin right before 1300. The Duomo in 1296, the Palazzo Vecchio in Florence in 1299, the Public Palace in Siena just a couple of years earlier. Petrarch throughout his life professed to dislike Florentines on the whole. He was very reluctant to go to Florence. He eschewed opportunities to move there even when invited. Late in life, he described his parents as exiled Florentines who were, as he put it, almost poor. Florence, in his view, had never been kind to any of them. This perhaps was an exaggeration, but it was certainly the way Petrarch perceived this world. Not productive in the way that he saw in places like Genoa, and yet nonetheless part of his life. Well, one of the famous images right, of this particular world that we think of is inside the Palazzo Publico in Siena. Famous, famous allegory right, of what a medieval city looks like in Italy in this period. Some of you may have even seen this if you've ever visited there, right? You go inside the Room of the Nine, the seat of the government in this period, and we see that in the very years just before Petrarch takes his famous second trip to Rome to be crowned poet laureate, Ambrosio Lorenzetti produces what is most popularly described, there are different titles for it, it's most popularly described as the allegory of good and bad government. Right, so this is this image of a well-ordered city in which everything functions. People are getting married, they're dancing in the streets, they're, um, you know, they're buying and selling at the banki, right, in, in, in the center of the city. They're bringing goods in and out from city to countryside. All of this looks absolutely pristine and perfect. And yet, what does Petrarch have to say about cities? Leave the city to the merchants, the lawyers, the brokers, the usurers, the bidders, the doctors, the insatiable do-nothings, always sniffing out the smell of the market. While spending a lot of time in cities, he constantly told us that this vision of the city was not for him. And it in part was not for him because it embodied the market that he especially loathed and also the failed contrast of his present to live up to the Roman ideals that he cherished. Because right next to this image of the secure city, on the other wall, was a reminder perhaps of the other half of this reality, right? Of bad government, of tyranny in the form of a horned devil. By the early 14th century, Siena, which at its height had been the largest city in Italy, around 120,000 people at its height in the 13th century, had declined to around 30,000 people roughly about the same size as Rome in this period also, which was also a very small city relative to the city of a million at its height in the ancient world. It was no longer able to defeat Florence, um, even though it built a very big bell tower to compete with the Florentine Campanile, et cetera. It instead was the kind of place that led Petrarch to say things like this. I'm alive now, yet I would have rather been born in some other time. And he, he often said clearly that he wouldn't only have been born in the past, but he wouldn't mind being born in some future yet to come. Right? So here we see Petrarch thinking about the uses of the past to define some sort of other present. Petrarch's first concrete adult experience of Italy came from when he studied in Bologna. His father had decided he would study law. He studied a bit in Montpellier, and then he went to Bologna for 
six years, where he studied civil law and while he admired the great medieval lawyers who had made this medieval university famous, right, the most ancient of the universities in this part of Italy, he admired the antiquity and the revival of Roman law at the center of the kind of knowledge that they represented, but he concluded that he could never be a lawyer because its practice in the real world of the medieval Italian cities was too corrupt a profession for what he had in mind. I like to think that in many ways, it was his experience of Bologna that led him to say, I never liked this present age. <laughs> and this, by the way, is a little model reconstruction of what Bologna looked like. Some of you may know the story of the towers that are knocked down in many towns. Siena had around 200. My colleague Ed English, who's here with Carol Lansing, was reminding me last night at dinner. And Bologna had around 180. So imagine being a university student in what basically is not just simply an armed, warring encampment of people fighting, but of factions that have physically shaped the city around these relationships, right, of powerful families who are all retreating, you know, into their fortresses. Um, no wonder why he didn't like his present. In 1326, Pet Petrarch's father dies, and he returns to Avignon. In Avignon, he begins to work for modern Romans, members of the Colonna family that, in fact, will produce the pope, Martin V, who brings the papacy back to Rome in 1420, and to read intensively ancient Romans. So back in Avignon, he dreamed of Rome, his utopia, a world of philosophers and poets, he felt, who lived more or less on something like Mount Olympus, Later in life, he would be quite distressed when he read more of Cicero as he discovered Cicero's manuscripts to realize that ancient Rome was perhaps as complicated as his own modern world. But the dream remained, right? The dream remained um, and influenced many ways that he thought about what he ought to do. He retreated more and more from Avignon. And as he retreated, some of you will, will already know this story. He famously decides at one point, after he's found this kind of pastoral enclave in the Vaucluse, right, in this, this rural community, that he will climb Mont Ventoux. And so allegedly, we don't know if he actually climbed Mont Ventoux in 1336 or whether he just chose that date because he was the same age as his ancient Christian hero who loved the Romans, Augustine when he made this great personal voyage with his younger brother, who later on became a monk. But when he got to the top of Mont Ventoux through this wonderful allegory, right, of different ways to go through a path in life, the direct and hard path, right, the spiritual like his brother, the indirect and complicated path, the temporal path that he was taking, he nonetheless at the top thought, once again, of Italy, turned towards Italy, he also said that at the top, he ceased to think of place, which he had thought of intensely along this arduous voyage, and began to think of time. And he longed once again to go to Rome. And again, of course, translating from the Latin, I realized that he also was hoping that he would win the Tour de France. But it was not to be, because in 1336, I think Lance Armstrong was his first victory or something like that. But my, my husband's an avid cyclist, so I couldn't resist that. So Mont Ventoux inspires him to turn towards Italy, to think of Rome, to think of time. And in the next year, he makes his first trip. At last, I came to Rome, he writes, to see this city, to see the ruins, right, of the old Basilica of St. Peter's. And if you read his letter, that pretty much is what he says in many ways. But he also then tries to reassemble it according to the history of the monuments that have remained. The question for Petrarch from this moment on is, as he develops his knowledge of the ancient world, is how best to use it. He continues to think about this in various ways. 10 years later, he has his first and most disappointing opportunity, Rome in 1347. This is no Easter Sunday. In Rome of 1347, the son of a Roman tavern keeper who, like Petrarch, loved the classics and saw himself as a reincarnation of an ancient Roman named Cola di Rienzo stood on the Capitol and more or less proclaimed himself 
tribune of liberty, peace, and justice, all these words that are in Lorenzetti's fresco about good government. Within a matter of months, he was de deposed. And while he lingered on the horizon for a few more years, he turned out to be a disappointing and failed example of an attempt to revive the Roman Republic. Petrarch was enormously optimistic in 1347. If the popes wouldn't return to Rome, perhaps the Romans would reclaim their city. And he pinned great hopes immediately on Cola di Rienzo as an example of this return of the Romans. Um, it was Cola who declared that time had changed when he dated one of the letters he wrote to Petrarch year one. This was political rebirth, or perhaps um, a, a kind of vision that has lingered ever since in the minds of people like Napoleon and Mussolini and Hitler and a few others. Yes. This restarting of the clock, of course, turned out to be a broken machine. Cola quickly disillusioned Petrarch. He realized that Rome was far better as a state of mind. It was better to dream about Rome. Republican virtues, he continued to wonder, might not work in the real world. Finally, in the middle of this life, right, to paraphrase Dante, Petrarch finally visited Florence. 1350, Jubilee year, he had to go to Rome for the Jubilee. On the way, he stopped in Genoa, stopped in a few other places, and in October, he finally reached Florence, where he was met outside the, the city, the gates of the city, by one of the most famous Florentines of this period, Giovanni Boccaccio, a banker turned literary scholar who also did the books for the Florentine government. Boccaccio put him up. He introduced him to all of his literary friends in Florence so Petrarch could see that there was indeed a thriving literary culture. Petrarch, in turn, encouraged them to, to think about a Florentine rediscovery of the Latin classics, which would actually take root in the next generation in many ways. They began to exchange manuscripts because they too were manuscript hunters. Shortly after this encounter, when Petrarch had moved on and was then in Padua in the Venetian Republic, the Florentines sent Boccaccio to Padua to ask Petrarch whether he would return and take a job in Florence at their university, at the Florentine Studium. Petrarch returned to Avignon shortly thereafter. In return, the Florentines decided that they would not restore the family properties that his father had lost when the family had gone into exile. When Petrarch returned to Italy two years later, in 1353, he decided instead to live in Milan, not a center of Republican liberty, to say the least, but certainly with none of these complicated reminders of the difficulties of being from a Florentine family. Now, this brings me to the last part of this talk, right? How to think about all these different ingredients in Petrarch's life is something like a road to the Renaissance. At one moment in his great unfinished piece of epic poetry, his Africa, Petrarch wrote, when the darkness breaks, the generations to come may manage to find their way back to the clear splendor of the ancient past. He knew that they were still groping in the dark. These metaphors of light and darkness in Petrarch are one of the primary reasons that we often think of him as a kind of founding father, right, of what we would describe as the Renaissance. Because while he never used the term Renaissance or rebirth, right, in either Italian or Latin, so much of his other language about a world of darkness, right, and a world of light, and the relationship between darkness and light in the cycles of history ultimately became the roadmap for those who did invent these terms, retrospectively citing people like Petrarch and Boccaccio as their heroes. Where did Petrarch see this rebirth, given how disappointing Rome turned out to be, how frustrating Florence was, and the fact that Genoa and Venice, however wonderful, were primarily commercial overseas republics? even as they supported men of learning. He was one of the early people to see aspects of this rebirth, of this light, in the paintings, for instance, of a very interesting earlier Tuscan painter who he would have known in his youth, Giotto. In his 1370 will, Petrarch wrote, 
that one of his most cherished possessions was a Giotto Madonna. His friend Boccaccio said of Giotto that he brought back the light of an art buried for many centuries. That is almost as close to the term Renaissance as we might get in the middle of the 14th century. Petrarch died in 1374. And if we look forward now to think about the world that he helped to create, what is it that we see? I, of course, want to turn to Florence here as an example of Italy around 1400. In the first year of the 15th century, more or less, Leonardo Bruni, who's an example of the third generation of these Florentine humanists inspired by what Petrarch and his contemporaries had done, wrote this famous panegyric in the midst of their interdicting struggles with Milan, right, about who would control territory and the effect on each of these states. And he wrote, O oh, incredible magnificence and courage of Florence, O oh, true Roman people and descendants of Romulus, who would not now praise the Florentine name with the highest praise for its outstanding resilience and the greatness of its history. In this classic description of Florence, circa 1400, we see the Florentine humanist who saw themselves as heirs to Petrarch, improving upon Petrarch's project, including his Latin, which they made fun of by then because it was too medieval, reclaiming also the Roman ideal of Republican liberty as something that had succeeded not in Rome with Cola di Rienzo, and not only in the mind of Petrarch, but in their view in their city, the new Rome, of the beginning of the 15th century. We might argue that this is a fairly perverse view given what actually happened to Florentine politics. The heyday of popular rule or communal government was basically over. But myths and realities have always been part of how we think about the Renaissance as really one of the greatest historical allegories ever written by many, many hands. What did Florence look like in this period? The Duomo was still unfinished. Begun in the late 13th century, right? Begun in the 1290s. The nave was finally completed by 1380. And in 1418, famously, the Arte di Calimara would have a competition for the dome that was missing on this building. In many respects, of course, it looked no different than the Basilica of St. Peter's, if you think about it, other than the fact that the bricks were a bit newer. The baptistry door competition, just across the other side of the piazza, just a step away right from the main door, would open in 1401. These were examples of the world yet to come of the completion of medieval projects that lay at the core of this Renaissance city. I want to end now with, of course, the most famous of Florentine citizens in the heyday of the Renaissance, the Medici family. But much like Petrarch, I want to kind of offer you a slightly different view for just a couple of minutes to think with. Because, of course, we think of the Medici as the people who controlled and ruled the city, but this was not inevitable. So who were they at the end of Petrarch's day? In the late 14th century, no one expected a single family, let alone the Medici, to control this city, let alone a family that was not particularly prominent and certainly not prosperous. Cosimo de' Medici, who would be the beginning of this powerful political lineage, was a young, distant relative of a Florentine banker who decided to open up a branch in Rome in the Rome that the popes were not, but where their money flowed. The wealth of that Roman branch of this Florentine bank would become the nucleus of the wealth of the Medici. And in 1397, after his older relative had died, and he had worked his way up through the ranks, starting as a young apprentice and becoming a junior and then a senior partner, Cosimo's father, Giovanni de Bici de Medici, 
would transfer the Medici Bank from Rome to Florence while still maintaining the branch down there which produced more than half of the Medici wealth. Most of the Medici could not hold office. Cosimo could, but would decide that it was not a good idea. He would instead build an empire on the ground that in many ways had many of the ingredients of the empire that Petrarch had built in his mind and on paper. And after he died, he would become so well known, not just as a man who had been a very successful and savvy banker, as a man who had reinvented an entirely new style of politics, learn my language, Cosimo said one time famously when someone didn't understand how he did things. But he would also become one of the greatest patrons of the kind of learning and art that Petrarch valued. He too would build a great library. But he would do this while successfully engaging in business and politics and those very practices, human practices, that Petrarch eschewed. When he died in 1464, he was soon thereafter called Pater Patriae, father of his country. It was Cosimo more than anyone who fulfilled Petrarch's prophecy that a new Rome would rise and a renaissance would begin. Thank you very much. This program is brought to you by the Stanford Humanities Center. For more information, please visit us at shc.stanford.edu.